This is a presentation that just goes over very basic ideas behind hypothesis testing. Um, it's beginning before our chapter 9 in the textbook. And to begin with, the shoplifter in this example, I don't know who it is, it was just a picture I found on Google. Um, just so that's out of the way. Now, we're assuming that this is a shoplifter, or maybe they're not a shoplifter. Maybe they have already something in their purse. We don't know. Okay? So we're going to say this is defendant A. Now, with hypothesis testing, usually it starts with a claim. There's some claim about a truth. In this case, the claim is either this person is guilty or innocent. If I'm the shop owner and I see this, I'll probably claim that they're guilty. We'll have to go through the court and find out if that's actually the case using evidence. If I'm the accused shoplifter, I'm going to claim that I'm innocent, and I'm going to go to court to prove that I'm innocent. That's the basic premise behind hypothesis testing. Let's say that we assume a claim that the shoplifter makes is guilty. Okay, so we're going to start um, we're going to start making hypotheses using this claim. So the claim is the shoplifter is guilty. Okay. Now, in a court of law, usually here in the United States, we say that they're innocent until proven guilty. All right. In hypothesis testing, it's like saying do not reject the null hypothesis, which we'll see in a minute. Do not reject the null unless evidence shows otherwise. So our null hypothesis, it's notated as H sub 0, is going to be innocence. There's always the opposite, which would be the claim. In this case, the claim is the alternative hypothesis. So H sub 1 is the first alternative hypothesis. And in our example, there's only one alternative hypothesis. So there's a claim of guilt. And so we want to have evidence that shows guilt if we're claiming guilt. And if we're claiming innocence, which is not this example, but the claim could have been the null hypothesis if we were looking at the perspective from the defendant. Anyway, so we've clearly stated the claim. We've clearly stated the null hypotheses, but there's a formal way to do that. And so we're going to list the null and alternative hypotheses in a formal way. First, you decide what the claim is. It's the alternative hypothesis in this case. Defendant A is guilty of shoplifting. The null hypothesis is always the opposite of the alternative, and vice versa. So H sub 0, the null hypothesis, is that the defendant is innocent of shoplifting. Okay, so that's formal steps that we take in hypothesis testing. We have a claim. We define hypotheses that we're going to prove. Okay, and how do we decide which hypothesis is the one that we're going to support or reject? Naturally, if we reject the null hypothesis, we're supporting the claim. But we focus our attention on the null when we actually get into hypothesis testing. So what do we use? We use evidence plus judgment. Now here's some potential evidence that we could use in our hypothesis test. Suppose they have a prior criminal record that might be potential evidence caught in the act, witnessed by a third party, or recorded on security cameras. This is a very basic example. But you could say that if I had all the evidence, it would be 100% evidence. If I had less than that, it would be some other percentage, 75, 50%, so forth. Okay, so these are the potential evidence that we could have. Now, the judges probably have different judgment criteria. And uh, we're going to accept the judgment criteria or decide on a judgment criteria before we do the hypothesis test. In one case, in our example, one judge may say they need to have at least 80% evidence for a guilty verdict. Another judge may say you need to have at least 70% evidence for a guilty verdict. Now, looking at that amount of evidence, which judge do you think is more strict from the perspective of the shoplifter? Which one's more likely to convict? Okay. 
Well, if you look at the evidence, 70% evidence implies that you need less evidence to get a guilty verdict versus 80% evidence, which means you need more evidence in order to convict the shoplifter. I would choose, if I was convicted of shoplifting, a judge that was asking for more evidence than less. So let's choose this judge. Now, once you know the judgment criteria, you want to define regions, a region of rejection and a region of non-rejection. So this is our evidence graph. Okay, so 100% evidence down to 0% evidence. And I've already drawn this evidence graph here with his judgment criteria. Beyond 80%, we're going to say that the person is guilty. And so we call that the rejection region, where we reject the, the, the null hypothesis. The green region, less than 80% evidence, is the non-rejection region. And so we have that mapped out in an actual statistical hypothesis test as well. So looking at the evidence, we can see that they have no prior criminal record. They were caught in the act. They were witnessed by a third party, and they were recorded on security cameras having stolen. Now, obviously, if we have that much evidence in a court of law, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but we, we would expect them to be convicted of shoplifting with this type of evidence. But taking a statistical view, we're just going to say they have 75% of the potential evidence. Okay? So, let's see what the verdict is. We know that the null hypothesis is that the defendant A is innocent. The claim was that the defendant was guilty of shoplifting. Well, we draw our evidence graph, our regions of rejection and non-rejection, and we plot our evidence, which was 75% of the evidence, on the graph. And it shows that we fall into the non-rejection region, so we do not reject the null hypothesis. This is the same approach we take using statistics in hypothesis testing. Once we've failed to reject or we've chosen not to reject an null hypothesis, we do not have enough evidence to support the claim. And so the judge would say that the defendant is innocent. The official statistical language would be, do not reject the null hypothesis. There is not enough evidence to support the claim. The defendant A is guilty of shoplifting. Now, there's a caveat. We need to make sure that we know the criteria for this. So if you require at least 80% of the evidence, this would be the result. Okay. Now, when you're making these decisions, which is very similar to what we see in statistics, potentially you could make a mistake. What if this shoplifter is actually guilty and the judgment criteria that we used showed that they were innocent? Well, we have made an error. We may not ever know that we've made an error, but suppose that in this case we know that this defendant is actually guilty. That's a certain type of error. And so there's two types of errors. Is a type 1 error where the defendant is innocent the null hypothesis is true, but we reject it. The other type of error, the defendant is guilty, but we let them go free. That's the kind of error that we just demonstrated, where the defendant was guilty, but because of the judgment criteria, we said they were innocent. Okay, so to explain these a little bit further, a type 1 error is when our null hypothesis is in fact true, but we support the alternative hypothesis instead. Another way to say that is when you reject the null hypothesis when it is actually correct. For a type 2 error, another way to say that is the null hypothesis is false, but we reject the alternative instead of rejecting the null, which we should have rejected. And this is clearly based on our judgment criteria. And uh, another way to say the type 2 error, you do not reject the null hypothesis when it is actually incorrect. Now, type 1 error is what we refer to as having a probability of alpha. And alpha, if you remember, 
It is the complement of our confidence, which we'll get into later on. A type 2 error, we use the term beta, which represents the probability of making a type 2 error. We may never know that we made an error. Now, take for example this next criminal, okay? Or alleged criminal, I should say. The defendant, defendant B, does have a prior criminal record. They were caught in the act. They were not witnessed by a third party, but they were recorded on a security camera. So again, we have 75% of the evidence in our basic example. You should go through the process yourself and see if you can remember the steps. First, you need a claim. And then once you have that claim, you define hypotheses, you graph rejection regions, you check the evidence and plot it on a graph, and then once you've got everything in place, you can pass judgment. Okay? So this is basic hypothesis testing, and as we move into the material about testing for means and testing for proportions and so forth, we'll go through this again. But this is a basic idea of what hypothesis testing is, just in case it's confusing.